I'm Arthur Naylor. I'm the interim principal here at St Mary's, and it's my very pleasant uh, responsibility and duty to introduce Professor John Nicholson's inaugural lecture. Um, John Nicholson is a very distinguished materials scientist whose research concerns advanced materials for the repair of teeth and bones. Um, since coming to St Mary's, he's actually been very much more than a, a great research scientist. He's uh, leading on a, a, a new degree in applied physics with the National Physical Laboratory. Um, and he's also the uh, interim head of the School of Health and Applied Science, of Sport Health and Applied Science. And I must say, after a few weeks back, a very, very great asset to St Mary's. Um, John studied chemistry at uh, Kingston, University, his doctorates from London South Bank. He then joined the laboratory of the government chemist in 1983, where he eventually became head of materials research. Next, he moved to teach and research at the Dental Institute at King's College London, before taking up a personal chair in biomaterials chemistry at the University of Greenwich in 2002, and joined, joined St Mary's as Professor of Applied Science in 2012. Uh, John tonight is going, well that's the title, Long in the Tooth, um, and he tells me in this, that tooth decay is generally considered to be the most prevalent of all human diseases. Um, actually, coming from Scotland, that's something you'd recognise, <laughs> because the, the combined effect of, of uh, sweets, cakes, and deep-fried Mars bars uh, <laughs> It means that it's, it's quite prevalent from an early age. In fact, I was looking at the statistics um, because Scotland's got a desperate record in dental decay. But something, and it's sad, I mean, it's, it's awful, that a third of primary one children um, have dental decay. Um, it used to be 50%. Um, uh, so this is going to be a fascinating evening for those of us who remember dentistry with absolute horror in, in, in our own time. John has published uh, 160 scientific papers He's written four books, and uh, he's had 2,000 citations. And if you spare me for a, a horrible use of puns and words, John, you're a man of great wisdom. <laughs> and impact. <laughs> John. <laughs> Well, thank you. And after that introduction, I can't wait to hear what I've got to say. <clears throat> um, I called today's talk Long in the Tooth, partly in recognition of my extreme personal advancing years, um, but I wanted to add the subtitle The Physics of Tooth Repair, again, partly because, uh, as Arthur's mentioned, uh, I'm here in part uh, at St Mary's to lead the new applied physics degree and so I thought it was appropriate to mention physics in the context of this talk. I could have equally have said the material science of uh, tooth repair, and that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And as we go through, I will drop hints, not very subtle ones, about my personal contribution to this field, where uh, I'm going to be talking about my research. Uh, but before we do that, um, I want to thank, firstly, everybody who's come. It's a very interesting collection as I look around the faces in the audience of new colleagues, former colleagues, uh, old friends, and family members. And I do appreciate the fact that all of you have, have spared the time tonight. And I just hope, as I say, I make it worth your while. Um, so tonight, I'm going to be looking at these aspects of the subject. Um, we will start with a, some fairly dramatic discussion about the horrible topic of tooth decay. And then we're going to move on and look at how teeth are repaired. I'm going to take as the third point uh, modern materials, the kind of materials I've been working on, not as my exclusive research concern, but as my main ones for about the last 30 years. And I shall finish by saying a little bit about some of our current research activities, current in the sense that I'm still writing some of them up and in the sense that they represent some of the future work that we're going to be doing here, uh, partly at some areas and also with our involvement with National Physical Laboratory. There's one person who can't be here, but I would like to pay tribute to, uh, and this is uh, Dr. Alan Wilson, who was my mentor in this field. 
He was my head of department when I was at Laboratory of the Government Chemist. He was a brilliantly inventive scientist, and he invented the particular tooth material, the glass cyanamide cement, that I'll be spending quite a lot of time talking about. And he, uh, although he was my boss, we ended up becoming good friends, and he came to work with me when I moved to the King's Dental Institute. He was honorary senior research fellow there for several years, and in fact, uh, we published together what turned out to be his last paper in 2004. As he told me with some regret, he didn't quite make 50 years of publishing. The first paper was published in 1955, um, and so I did try, but we couldn't quite squeeze any more data out to give him his 50th year. But a very engaging man, and I wanted to honour him tonight at the beginning of my lecture. So now let's think about tooth decay, <clears throat> this horrible subject which we all have some idea about and no doubt some personal experience of. So here is a tooth, a typical sort of tooth, and these are the kind of components of a tooth that we need to be aware of. First of all, let me just see if I can work this one. Right, here is a tooth sitting in its socket in a piece of bone. Uh, the bone sort of rises to carry the tooth in what is known as the alveolar ridge. And running uh, around the edge, we have something that keeps it in place, the periodontal ligament. Now, those, these things may cause problems, but we're not going to be talking about those while we're concerned with teeth. I'm going to be thinking about the upper part of the tooth. And the upper part of the tooth is divided into three zones. On the outer layer, we have the enamel. The enamel is a substantially mineral tissue. It's the hardest tissue in the body. Uh, it's made up of a mineral called hydroxyapatite. And about 97% of the enamel is made up of this mineral. Uh, there's a few other bits and pieces in there, a pinch of water, a tiny bit of protein, but mainly it's um, the uh, mineral phase. Below it, in this sort of off-white color, we have the dentine, and that consists of uh, the mineral phase, about 70%, and the rest made up of water and of protein molecules, uh, a type of collagen. And uh, there's a sort of structure here, because running through the dentine are tubules which are filled with liquid. And uh, that structure makes a difference to the way dental decay progresses. And then right inside, we have what is known as the pulp, which consists of a mixture of blood vessels and nerve endings, and we will see both of those are significant when tooth decay takes hold. Wrong. So here's what the healthy tooth consists of, um, the mineral phase, and something about the mineral phase which is not immediately obvious, I think, to those of us not involved in dental research or in dentistry, and that is that the mineral phase is dynamic. Now, you might think that if anything's going to be left of you in about 500 years, when the 20, whatever it is, 26th century version of Tony Robinson is running Time Team, it will be your teeth and your bones. And therefore, they must be fairly innocuous. They must be sort of there. They are the bits on which you hang the, the flesh and the muscles and the bits that you recognize. But everything else is pretty dead. And the answer is that's not true. And it's not true particularly of the teeth, because the mineral phase is dynamic. It's bathed by uh, saliva, and saliva contains, among other things, calcium and phosphate ions. And what happens is that as uh, the local concentration may rise for some reason, these calcium and phosphate ions combine as the hydroxyapatite mineral and are deposited. And somewhere else, you may have a bit of the saliva that's a little bit depleted in calcium and phosphate, so the tooth dissolves. So we end up with a cycle uh, sometimes incorrectly referred to as an equilibrium, um, but a cycle where we have some deposition of mineral phase, known as remineralization, and some loss of mineral phase, known as demineralization. And this cyc cyclic process is happily taking place all the time in your healthy teeth. And if you want to just prove that it's taking place, if you eat something acidic that will have an effect, for example, uh, rhubarb, you will be able to run your tongue over your teeth and feel the surface is roughened up, roughened up by the oxalic acid in the rhubarb, and that's because some of the ions have been stripped out. But an hour or two later, your tooth surface will feel perfectly smooth because all those roughened parts have been smoothed out by the deposition of the calcium and the phosphate. So your teeth are dynamic. 
and they're happily looking after themselves, uh, bathed by this saliva, and everything should be well. However, there is a problem, and the problem is twofold. Uh, our mouths have got a layer on the teeth of microorganisms, a sort of colony. The main one is Streptococcus mutans, but there are others in that colony, and they sit on the tooth surface, or they stick on the tooth surface. They depart briefly when you've brushed your teeth, but when they can, they are back on there, and they will metabolize sugar, and when they metabolize sugar, you get acid produced. You get uh, particularly lactic acid, and there's been some really elegant research over the years that has analyzed in great detail the cocktail of acids that these microorganisms can produce and evaluated their effect. It doesn't take very much. The uh, surface of your tooth doesn't have to be especially acidic, and the demineralization, remineralization balance is unbalanced, and it starts to favor the demineralization. So your mineral phase starts to be lost. And what happens then in time, if nothing is done about it, is the tooth softens and discolors. Now, in order for that to happen, the uh, dental decay, so-called dental caries, has to progress through the enamel into the dentine, but uh, that is certainly the, uh, an, an in interesting staging post in the uh, loss of structure of your teeth when they start to decay. So here's a diagram to show the effects, and I've tried to divide this into three stages. First of all, we have early decay, which only affects the enamel. And it, as it says here, this damage is reversible. It's a bit like the damage you would do by eating rhubarb. Uh, that will reverse itself if you remove the source of the acid and you let the natural remineralization activity of the saliva take place. Now, that may not be what happens because the other possibility is that the, here we have number two, is that the decay goes through the dentine and then it does something that's important. It sort of balloons out. It spreads. And it spreads because the dentine is uh, lower in mineral phase. It's also got structure through which the acids can penetrate and through which the <coughs> microorganisms can, can operate. And so there's a spreading out of the dental decay. And so when you are in the dentist's chair and he or she comes at you with a mirror and a probe, what they're doing is poking the tooth See if those little openings may conceivably be the start of dental decay, because if it is, you could well have very significant spread out of sight of the dentist going on below the layer of enamel. And then if you don't do anything about it, if you are stoic or if you're a dental phobic, whatever it, your motivation, the whole thing spreads and uh, it goes into the nerve, into the blood vessels and so on as it says here, accompanied by severe toothache, uh, and eventually you can uh, damage the root canals and do further damage uh, to your body. Toothache always seems a bit of a joke, but it's actually not because of what it, it leads to. Now, here's a decayed tooth. It's uh, not the most in focus of the pictures, but I thought all the others were so revolting, I couldn't possibly show them to a polite audience. <laughs> there are some really horrendous things. If you really want to make yourself feel ill, uh, have a look at tooth decay on Google and have a look at some of the pictures there. But you can see what's happened. There is this discoloration as this caries has spread. And you get this pain. You get a pain that uh, occurs because uh, the nerves in the pulp are affected. So that's the first point. They, you have nerves inside your teeth. Uh, you may have an inflammation uh, that starts squeezing the nerves. Whatever it is, you get a pain and once upon a time, the people who studied this considered that this was probably caused by uh, an organism that no one had ever seen called the toothworm. Now, they may not have seen it, but they certainly knew what it did, because here is an ivory carving that shows the toothworm, and uh, this actually fits together. So it's got all the components of toothache that we, we know and to love and hate. Here's the worm. It's got its tail well wrapped around some poor person. But more importantly, on this side, we have the fires of hell, which represent the pain, and the, clearly the uh, fires are being, uh, the flames are being fanned to keep them going well, uh, which I'm sure is anybody's experience who's ever had tooth decay and toothache of this sort. So that was what they thought was happening, I don't know, four or 500 years ago. 
Uh, we know better now, but uh, we've got to think about how we treat it. Now, one question that we might ask is, does it matter? And there are various answers to this. Clearly, it does matter, um, because the TK tooth is a sort of focus of infection, and it can lead to all sorts of other unpleasant uh, side effects or effects. For example, you can get an infection that leads to the heart called endocarditis, which nobody would want. Um, you can also get a condition called Ludwig's angina, which in its worst manifestation causes swelling to travel down the neck and the patient to suffocate. So toothache is non-trivial. Uh, tooth decay is non-trivial, and we need to remember that. And we've got over the idea that uh, teeth are nasty things because of the uh, really significantly high-quality dentistry we've had in this country for a long time. But if you went back about 100 years, uh, in order to stop these kind of things happening to you, you may, if you've been lucky, have had as your 21st birthday present a trip to the dentist to have all your teeth taken out. And that was a very common preventive measure. If you haven't got any teeth, they can't decay, and you can't get all these conditions. Unfortunately, there are problems with that, not least that your alveolar ridge disappears, so by the time you get into your 50s and 60s, you can't balance any dentures on anything, so you can't eat anything except soup or drink things through a straw. So it wasn't a wise move, and we must be grateful that's no longer considered a good idea, but that certainly was uh, the sort of treatment that people had. So it does matter. The question is, what do we do about it? And when I say we, I'm now referring to the dental profession. I think I've got at least one of my dental colleagues here in the audience, so I hope I'm getting it all right so far. <laughs> um, so what do we do? Well, the first thing is to remove the damaged tooth tissue. That tissue is infected. It's got uh, microorganisms busily metabolizing, busily making this acid and uh, causing further tooth decay. So that's got to be removed. And in uh, the conventions of dentistry for a long time, all of the damaged tissue was removed. And that doesn't necessarily have to happen in all cases now, but pretty much you cut out the tooth tissue. And you wonder why you go to the dentist and you've got a big hole in the tooth from acid attack, why does the dentist start drilling? There are two reasons for that, as we will see, but one of them is to remove the damaged tissue. And then, of course, we replace that with artificial material. And for a long time, this was the material, and indeed it still is. I used to have a colleague in my days when I te taught at uh, King's College who used to give a lecture called Amalgam, the Material of the Future. And it's not just because he was old-fashioned, it's because he was making quite an important point and a provocative point that amalgam still works pretty well. Now, if we have, as we have had, not only in Scotland, a reduction in the incidence of tooth decay, and actually, with due respect to our esteemed principal, in most places the reduction in tooth decay is a bit more impressive than the statistics he gave us, um, people don't want to have their first filling in their, perhaps in their 30s, and have a massive great cut out of the tooth and a whacking great bit of silver put in place. So these are no longer really considered by many people to be the desirable way to do dentistry. But it's still very effective. It works. And uh, uh, the whole response or the result of the tooth is functional. Here's just another illustration. I didn't mind taking pictures of amalgam fillings. They're, they're not, not so bad. But increasingly, people are interested in tooth-colored and I will then say aesthetic materials. Now, the profession will refer to these as aesthetic, but I want to make it very clear what I mean. Because again, from my days teaching at King's College in the dental school, I started a lecture, in fact, I think my lecture was probably called Aesthetic Tooth Materials, and a student came up to me from a, a different ethnicity and said, I don't understand what you're talking about because we find gold teeth quite attractive. So they thought that was aesthetic. Well, it depends on your taste and your aesthetics, but uh, clinical dentists think that teeth are aesthetic, and I'm inclined to agree with them. So I'm going to be talking about tooth-colored materials. And really, we have two broad classes of material. There are subsets. Uh, there are hybrids of these, but I don't want to take you too far down that path. I regret not being able to do so in a way, because my absolute citation classic, which uh, has been cited 261 times, is on the classification of uh, modern dental restorative materials. So I could have taken you through that, and uh, it would only have been the sounds of other people in the row snoring that would have, would have kept you going. So I don't want to do that, but I want to just talk about these, these basic essential classes of material. And um, 
Oops, let's go back a bit. On the path quite a lot. Let's talk first of all about the composite resins, which are the more successful, more widely used of the tooth coloured materials. Essentially, these are plastic fillings, and when they were first on the market, they came as two pastes. So it was very similar to uh, gluing something together with araldite. Uh, when you used these, you had two tubes and you mixed the two rather viscous paste together, uh, and that was your filling material. Now they do things a bit more uh, subtly in terms of the chemistry. You have one paste, uh, it's still fairly viscous, it's put into position in the tooth, and then it's cured with light. That means it's turned from being a sticky, viscous paste into being a solid plastic material. They look very good. They have actually got extremely good aesthetics. Their problem is that they don't stick to the tooth surface. Right, none of the materials we've talked about do so far, and therefore they need special glues, which are known as bonding agents. And it's a little, worth having a little aside here, because um, glues as a technology, adhesives, is a growing area of physical science. People are increasingly impressed by the ability to glue things together. So if you fly in the latest passenger jet, lots of it's glued together. And if you buy a very modern car, lots of that's glued together. And if you ask the technologists, the scientists working on that, they'll tell you it's all right as long as you don't get them wet, which is great, and they don't in the bits that they've got in a plane or a car. But in the mouth, you have a little bit of a problem with this requirement, and the durability of these bonding agents is a live issue. Now, it's sometimes difficult to persuade the clinicians and some of the researchers it's a live issue, but it is. And if you look at the durability, if you look at what's happening in terms of how these glues are degrading, there is a problem here. So... Well, these things do look great. They're very, very successful materials, but they are not without their problems. So this is what they look like now when the dentist or possibly the dental nurse opens the box. They come in these black tubes. Now, I said they were light cured, so obviously you can't have them in a clear bottle or something because otherwise they'd set hard. So you have them in a black tube to protect them from light. They normally come with uh, a few other bottles of jollop to um, actually stick them in place. And my picture that I inadvertently leapt to here is some uh, happy man having a composite resin placed, the little uh, probe here showing the light shining on the filled tooth. And uh, I hope everybody is having a dental treatment in this way now, swallowing a, what looks like a piece of rubber glove. Uh, this is known as the rubber dam and is a way of isolating the area and making it dry, which is very important for the modern materials. And this is the kind of repair you can get with a composite. Um, this is actually the before. Somebody here has had some sort of trauma. And uh, I don't know, it's the same sort of thing that happened to my niece. She fell off her horse and broke a front tooth. And so uh, the tooth has now been repaired. This is a repaired tooth repaired with composite resin. And that is a phenomenal repair. Um, there are several things about it that's phenomenal. The first is... The colour is brilliant. In the words of Eric Morecambe, you cannot see the join. And uh, the colour, not only has got the colour right, but there's an, a hint of translucency that you get in the tooth. And as well as that, the mechanical properties of the composite are going to be good enough for it to survive for quite a long time. Its particular property is that it's a tough material. It's got enough give in it that it can be used on the biting surface of the tooth and you can uh, expect it to survive, as indeed it will. In fact, it's a little bit tougher than the uh, natural tooth that it replaced. And so the key property, and I want to talk about this because of some of my research interests, the key property of the composite resin is toughness. And at this point, I'd like to have a little digression into some of these concepts from material science. I want to talk a little bit about what we mean by toughness. First of all, it's a material property. If something's tough, it's tough whether you have a big lump of it or a very small piece. And it's generally considered the opposite of brittleness. So let's explore this a little more detail. Let us consider some experimental work. We'll just do a kind of thought experiment at the moment. And I'd like us to consider this particular <coughs> experimental tool that we can use to investigate material properties. For the uninitiated, this is called a hammer. Um, and uh, we can, with a hammer, find out 
the sort of properties of materials. And effectively, or essentially, there are three types of material properties you can get and you will find if you investigate with a hammer. First of all, we have metals. Metals have their own sort of behavior, and particularly, metals have behavior, which only ever turn up in uh, examination questions. You have to learn the words malleable and ductile when the word metal is mentioned, even if you don't know what it means. So I've got a picture in here to show what it means. Malleable means that you can basically beat a piece of metal into a new shape. Uh, that's normally, I've got a picture of here, it's desirable. Of course, if you drive your car into a lamppost, you will discover that, and it's not such a desirable effect, because the metal will not just bounce back, it will change its shape permanently. So we can, uh, with a, the aid of a hammer, or in this case a mallet, we can change the shape of the metal. Ductile means metals can be drawn out into wires, but we can change their shape by applying forces to them. Then we come on to another group of materials, the brittle materials, represented by glasses and ceramics. So what happens if we explore the uh, behavior of a brittle material with the aid of our experimental tool? Well, that's what happens. Nobody would try and change the shape of a bottle. Well, you do change the shape of a bottle, but you wouldn't try and control it, you know, change it in a controlled way with the aid of a hammer. So that's the behavior of a brittle material. And finally, we get on to tough. Now, an example of a tough material is rubber, which is probably an extreme example, but what happens if you hit that with a hammer? Well, you're not going to deform it. The uh, hammer's going to bounce back. It may not actually be the safest experiment, so probably a substantial risk assessment's required before you can think about doing it. But you can tell that if you hit something that's tough, uh, you're not going to fracture it. Now, materials do tend to break if you load them enough, but these are the broad categories of material. So our composite resin turns out to be of this general type. It's got toughness. And that's going to be important for one of the things I want to go on to say when I talk about some of our future research. Now I want to go on to the second broad class of tooth-colored material, um, the glass ionomer cement. As I mentioned near the beginning, invented by my former boss, uh, Dr. Alan Wilson, and fairly widely used in dentistry, but not quite as widely used and not quite as satisfactory as the composite resins. They are cements, and uh, that means they're water-based. They have all the appearance to the uninitiated of polyfiller, though they are a lot more subtle than that. Uh, they are so-called self-cured. That means that when you mix the components together, they start to react and they turn from the paste into a, a solid material very quickly. So you have a powder and you mix it with a liquid. They look okay, which is to say they're on the way to tooth colored, but you certainly could see the join if you try to repair a front tooth uh, with current glass ionomer cements, and they don't have such a good translucency or quite such a good color match. They have a very significant advantage that they adhere well to the tooth surface, so they're naturally adhesive, so you don't have to worry about degradation of your glues and things like that. You can get a glass enema into a tooth, it will stay there. And the disadvantage is that they are brittle. Think green wine bottles, and you'll remember, they break quite easily. And that means that that particularly stunning repair that I showed with composite resin can't be done with glass enema, because the minute you bit into something hard, it would fracture, it would snap into little bits, and, and you'd have to be collecting the pieces and going back to the dentist. So uh, they are not, they do not have the right properties for those sort of clinical applications. This is how they are presented. Uh, well, there are various ways they're presented, but this is one of the ways they come with the powder. This actually contains a special reactive glass. And amazingly, when you make this glass, when you first make it, it actually looks like a piece of window glass, you have a clear uh, sort of piece of glass, but it's ground up into a very fine powder when it turns up as a white, and normally we have a little bit of pigment added to that, and that's so tooth colored. And we have a liquid, and that liquid consists of water with normally polyacrylic acid dissolved in it, and the polyacrylic acid reacts with the glass to make the cement set. And these are the ways uh, the, the cements are presented. This is, uh, may not look like a precise a piece of scientific equipment, but this is actually a carefully metered scoop, and 
the dentist or the dental nurse scoops out an amount of powder and then matches it with a number of drops from this bottle, which has a fairly carefully engineered nozzle. And amazingly, just measuring scoops and drops is sufficiently accurate, at least it's as accurate as you're going to get in a dental clinic. I always have to persuade my research students that we're not going to mix drops and scoops, we're going to actually weigh everything out so that we know what we've done and we reduce at least one possible source of error. But I'm not so bothered when it's going to go in a mouth, so this is the sort of measurement technique that's used. This is a little picture to show how it's done. Um, our bottle of liquid held upside down, carefully metered out, counting out the drops, two drops of liquid, one scoop of powder on a mixing paper, and then the whole thing is mixed. So here's uh, somebody measuring out a small amount of the glass, and you can see it looks like a white powder. In fact, it is a white powder, but it started off looking like a sheet of glass. And then this is it being mixed. I don't know how visible that is, but there is a little lump of the cement being mixed with the spatula, and uh, say to all the world, looks like a rather thick mix of polyfiller, and that's going to go into someone's tooth. Now, if you do put it in someone's tooth, uh, you can exploit the uh, adhesion by using it for certain repairs that you can't otherwise make, and these are the two glass anima repairs, known in the dental profession as class five cavities, but you can see this is not a brilliant match for the tooth color, but it looks quite opaque. It will improve slightly with time because glass animals do undergo slow maturation processes, not fully understood, but there, are, there is some slow chemistry going on there that is associated with a slight change of appearance, but that isn't so totally atypical, so you can tend to see where a glass animal has been placed. Now, one of the great things about the adhesion is you can do things with it that are an asked prayer, and one is you can do filling without drilling. And this is the so-called atraumatic restorative treatment technique. It was developed for use in the third world, and uh, in the third world, the real problem, as far as dentistry is concerned, is you don't have a reliable source of electricity, so you can't have your uh, dental drill going. Yippee, I can hear you thinking. So um, what they have to do is different means of removing the diseased tissue. So what they have developed is a series of scoops, metal scoops, sort of handheld with subtly different shapes that enable the dentist to work out the softened tooth material. Now, you can't make such a clean surface with this technique as you can with a dental drill. On the other hand, I wouldn't be that bothered. I wouldn't mind seeing the end of the drill. It would be nice to be using it much more in Western dentistry. Um, but it tends to have been used in third world countries, so there have been a lot of clinical studies now in places where, sadly, they've began, begun to get a Western diet, so they've got McDonald's and they've got Coca-Cola, but somehow they haven't got toothpaste. So places like Zimbabwe, uh, parts of South America, uh, and so on, um, have benefited from this sort of technique. And if you go to an art-type clinic, this is a close-up of a dentist working, and this is a bigger clinic. You can see how they're working with this, this technique. And there's not a drill in sight. So that's pretty good. So we can use glass items for this kind of process. And that is very significant. And that's been a, an important development in the health of developing countries. And this is an art restoration. And so, uh, as before, you can still see it. It's no, still not a fantastic uh, match for the tooth. But it's not bad. Uh, and uh, certainly better than amalgam would be. And the fact that we can do it at all with no drilling is significant. So that's a, an important use of glass iron and the cements. So that's a little bit about their background, how they're used, what we use them for, why we're bothering. And I want to just talk a bit about some of the current research moving into future research. And the two areas that are significant of, in, certainly in my research activities are studies of their bioactivity and also improving their toughness. If we could get them from being uh, very brittle materials to tougher materials, well, the dream might be that we could use them uh, for the sort of restoration we see for the composite, and we could get away from the worries about how long the composite glues are going to last. Whether we'll get there or not remains to be seen, but that's certainly a theme that I'm working on. So let's think about bioactivity. And I was actually talking to my wife about this slide because I said I did years of work on this iron exchange process, published four or five papers, 
and I've got it all on one slide that we're going to brush over in 30 seconds. So I, I want to mention it to you lot as well, just to say that we did a lot of work to show this was the case, but we discover that glass ionomers will uh, release, well, fluoride was known for a long time, that wasn't our discovery, although we have looked at the exchange of fluoride because in uh, conditions of high fluoride, i.e. when you brush your teeth with a fluoride toothpaste, uh, these cements will take up fluoride, uh, so then they go on releasing it on other occasions. But the release of these kind of ions and the conditions under which they release, are released, the amount that's released, the way it varies with time, the way it varies with local acidity, uh, and also the way it may change in the presence of saliva when calcium and phosphate might be taken up, uh, took up fair chunks of research time. But they are able to exchange these ions, and that makes a big difference. So one of the things that happens is that glass ionomers that have been in saliva become much harder. And if we look at their elemental composition, they have obviously taken up calcium from saliva. So they're dynamic in that ex to that extent. If you have them in very thin layers, and there's only been one study of this, one report of this, but it's a very important one, uh, the whole structure develops a kind of artificial enamel. So here we have a material that could, in the end, not just be a totally artificial material, we could end up with something that's going to be so biomimetic that in the presence of saliva, it's going to develop a sort of enamel. Now, whether that normally happens or not, I, I wouldn't like to say, and I think probably doesn't. But now that we know it's a possibility, we need to look at the ability of these ions to be exchanged and to see what we can make of them. Now, fluoride release is very important, and fluoride release in dental schools as a research topic is a cottage industry. Uh, lots of people get involved in it. We know that glass ionomers will release fluoride for a long time, and then you get this kind of study where someone's taken several different brands on the market and just plotted fluoride release. And very often the goal is to say, well, here's a brand, this must be the best because it releases the most, um, but they kind of rank them and, and do this kind of thing. Um, I'm not overly uh, impressed by this, uh, but there's quite a lot of this sort of thing that happens. I mean, it shows what we know anyway, which is that they release fluoride. Fluoride is included in the glass composition. Fluoride is desirable uh, as a preventive measure for the spread of tooth decay because fluoridated uh, tooth mineral, fluoridated hydroxyapatite, uh, is resistant to uh, the attack of acids. So if you have some of your mineral phase lightly fluoridated, then the acids can't progress at anything like the rate or indeed at all. So uh, fluoride is desirable, and the release of fluoride from uh, a repaired cavity where there's a bit of a history of tooth decay is certainly uh, beneficial. Some of the iron exchange may not be desirable. If you put your glass iron and cements into water quite early on and some of the ions leak out of the surface, you start potentially to cause problems. And we've only just found this in the last two or three years. But the biggest thing that you can get is that the cements become weaker. Um, we're not entirely sure why this is, but... Uh, Lizzie, who's in the audience, my PhD student, will be able to tell you in about three years' time when she's finished her PhD, because we're going to be looking at these ion exchange processes and ways of controlling them and trying to establish exactly what the uh, correlation is between the extent of weakening and the change in composition that we see when these ions are released. Now, we can control iron release, and dentists quite like to do that. They may well coat a new, uh, newly placed glass ion with varnish, and that, they're not trying to control iron release, they're actually trying to stop the whole thing, which is water-based, from drying out before it sets. But controlling iron uh, release uh, may also uh, ensure that you have a stronger filling. And again, that's something to be looked at. And as I said here, this is the plug for Lizzie's PhD project. We've got a new project to examine this aspect and various other aspects connected with surface properties of glass ionomers and this iron exchange. Now, they do form their very durable bonds to teeth as a result of this iron exchange. So this is definitely a good thing in the right place. And if you have a filling right up against a tooth, this is what you can find. This is a, an electron micrograph, so it's a scanning electron microscope picture, very high magnification, of the interface between a tooth and a cement. And that cement has been in the tooth for about five years. 
Now that's a, uh, and I chair the uh, college's ethics committee, I can tell you that's an unethical experiment, except in the way it was done, which is that after a period of time, there may be need to remove teeth, for example, for orthodontic reasons, and so you can then collect teeth that have been filled some years earlier and have a look at what's happened. And the, these are from, this is from some Australian researchers in the late 1990s, and what they found, to their surprise, when they first did it, was that the interface between the cement and the glass ionomer uh, develops quite a substantial structure. And the other thing that was a surprise uh, was the composition of it. This is a little piece of glass here, so we know the glass ionomer cement is this side, this is the tooth side. The glass ionomer cement they happened to use in their study was strontium-based. So when they looked at this interface, they discovered that the interface contains both strontium ions and calcium ions. So the strontium can only have come from the cement side, and the calcium can only have come from the tooth side. So there is a very slow chemical reaction that leads to a loss of a distinct interface and the development of this rather thick zone, and that uh, it means that these materials have extremely secure bonding. They will stick in place really well. They won't leak. Bacteria can't get down the sides if you've got this sort of filling and this sort of bonding. But this is an important big plus for glass iron and cements. Which takes us on to our big research topic. How are we going to improve the toughness of these materials? Because if we could do that, we've got a lot of useful biological stuff that we can build into the materials, and we're going to have something that will really will uh, have an enormous range of clinical uses uh, and be uh, potentially at least popular with patients. And as I say again, if it, if it coincided with the end of the dental drill, that would be wonderful. Um, so we'd like to make glass ionomers tougher, and then we will be able to extend their clinical uses. And as well as extend their clinical uses, we'd make them more durable. Because they're brittle, they will suddenly break in service and then they have to be replaced. So both of these factors would improve if we could improve their uh, toughness. So let's now think, having seen what the uh, experiment with a hammer would do, let's now have a look at the sort of structure that materials have that gives them their particular properties. And it's clearly related somehow to their underlying atomic and molecular structure. So we'll start with metals, which as we saw, you can bend either around a lamppost or perhaps more satisfactorily into the shape of a trumpet. And in the case of metals, what we have is ions essentially floating in a sea of electrons without the electrons being bonded to any particular atom. And uh, they're free to move about within the solid. That's why metals conduct electricity. It also means that if you bash one end of this piece and bend it, for example, into an L shape, the ions over here are quite happy to move. The, the electrons don't mind flowing around corners but freely. So the whole thing will bend or be drawn out without too much difficulty. We go to something that's ceramic. We now have directional bonds. We have electrons that are in very tight locations, and nothing there wants to move. That's all held really rigidly. And so when somebody comes along with a hammer, well, if you tap it lightly, nothing happens. But eventually, you get to the point where a whole lot of chemical bonds break together. They can't, they can't resist it anymore, and they just all go. So you get breaking of chemical bonds rapidly and catastrophically in a ceramic material because they are directional. So why, why is that a problem, or why is that, what is the structural feature? Essentially, that all these atoms are rigidly held in these sort of areas and uh, they're knotted together fairly tightly. And then we have rubbers. Well, this is the best I could do for a polymer, but we have rubbers where you can get some sort of flow. In the case of rubbers, there is some light knotting, so the, the molecules will bounce back. But tough materials, in general, have molecules with a fair amount of freedom that are able to flow past each other. So is that what we want with glass ionomers? Yes, it probably is, and it's not what we're getting at the moment. So now we think about why glass ionomers are brittle. Well, we actually know why they're brittle. We know that inside our setting cement, we have polyacrylic acid. And we know that uh, as the reaction takes place, the glass leaches some ions out. And these ions effectively 
tie the polymer chains up in knots, and they have a very high density, so the resulting cement is uh, brittle. And the main problem is caused by aluminium. Now, aluminium is in the glass, aluminium is present, and this is what aluminium likes to do when it's sitting in any sort of structure. So you look at this and think, what is this? This is an aluminium atom, and it's sitting there surrounded by six nearest neighbors. And that's what aluminium really likes. It wants to be in what we call six coordination. And so for a long time, we assumed that aluminium was coming out of the glass and it was finding atoms on the poly polyacrylic acid chain to bond to and therefore was sitting there creating knots. So we knew this from spectroscopic studies. But more recently, I've been involved in quite a big project using neutron beams and working at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. And here's a little picture of the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory um, because it's quite impressive. You can ignore this thing up here, which is a diamond light source, but what we have here, may not be so obvious from the picture, is a little mound in which there is a controlled nuclear reaction going on, and that nuclear reaction is generating neutrons, and neutrons are being fired out. In fact, they'd be fired in all directions, but there's a lot of lead shielding around here, but here are two massive factory-sized huts, and what you do is you get yourself uh, a week or so on the beam, and the neutrons uh, will be provided for you. You turn up with your sample, you go and work in the hut. Some technician takes off your sample and disappears and puts it in the beam, and you can sit watching completely meaningless-looking numbers appear on a computer screen for the remainder of the week, and eventually some poor soul of a technician takes his glowing item out of the neutron beam and I don't know where they dispose of it. They must be disposing of it safely because it's pretty radioactive by then. But as a result of the uh, diffraction patterns you can get from the neutrons, you can start to look at uh, really quite intimate details of the structure. And so what we've been able to find, well, we knew for a long time that aluminium reacted quickly, but what we discovered was that those initial fixed coordinate structures that I showed were not necessarily uh, the same as the knots. Some of those aluminiums are surrounded by water molecules, not by polyacrylic acid molecules. And if it's surrounded by enough water, it's not a knot at all. It's just sitting there. So what was gradually happening was that these aluminium were, aluminiums were losing water or whatever else was surrounding them that was small and turning themselves into knots. And the interesting thing is that if you look at this and just look at the details of the atomic structure, it turns out the glass ionomers are really quite tough up to about 10 hours. And then they go on reacting, and by 24 hours they're brittle, and certainly after several months they are extremely brittle. So our challenge is, can we stop the setting reaction? Can we stop the maturation reaction at 10 hours? Can we arrest the setting and make them tough? Well, that is what we're trying to do. There's going to be a big project, we hope. We can persuade the good folk of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, uh, of which I'm, I'm a member of the research team, with a process of looking at how we can arrest what I'm calling this knotting process uh, by controlling how aluminium uh, is able to react inside these cements. If we get that, then we should have a tough, tooth-colored, adhesive, bioactive material. So that's, uh, that's a very substantial goal. So that brings me now to the end of my lecture. And just very quickly, I'd like to summarize. Glass ionomers, the materials I've been working on, uh, are widely used in modern dentistry. And we've seen why. We've seen the need to repair teeth. We've seen what they do uh, and why this is desirable. Clearly, there is scope to improve them. We'd always say that as researchers. But here, there really is scope. And there's something particularly significant because we could conceivably make very important improvements that would change the whole public perception of the visit to the dentist. So what I'd say is we are trying. Thank you.